So I, I think that's all of it. I hope that's all of it. You know, we were looking at um, just the gospel of, of John of the last couple, really last, almost the last couple of years almost. And have you ever wondered, or you ever wished that you could have been living with Jesus or walking with Jesus when he was walking in the earth 2,000 years ago? I mean, like, haven't you ever kind of wished, like, how cool would that have been to have walked with Jesus and, and to have just shared life with him while he was doing public ministry for the couple years? Like, like, how awesome would that have been? And start thinking about, you know, why would it be such an awesome point of, of our lives? And I think there's several reasons. One of, it, one of them is there's this incredible confidence when you with Jesus. Like if you were to walk with Jesus, just imagine there's a lot of things that happened in Jesus' days in public ministry that people simply didn't get. You know, why, why would Jesus heal somebody and then say to them, don't tell anybody? It doesn't make sense. Or, 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 tell, or other people tell them. Or, or why, why would Jesus, you know, why did Jesus only raise, you know, one or two people from the dead? Like, he had, you know, why not just walk around going healed, healed, raised, 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 right, right? You ever thought about that before? And, or or maybe, maybe even some of the discussions about his death. Like, we realize that they never got it. They never understood that he was supposed to die. Even to the point of on the cross, they, they never got it. And, and Jesus, is, as he's ministering, um, there, there is really a lot of things that they didn't understand in the teachings or parables. But here's something that I know. There was an incredible confidence that while we didn't understand what was happening, or while they didn't understand what was happening, they knew who they were with. Think about that for a moment. So there was an incredible confidence that while they did not understand everything taking place, they, they could not figure everything out, they had an incredible confidence that the one that they were attached to knew what he was doing. To me, that builds, like, yeah, I wish Jesus was here. And then Jesus speaking truth. I mean, he has a great grasp of Scripture, being God, Great grasp of scripture and was able to separate the spirit of the law from the letter of the law. And he could just work through truth in many different moments. And I think about like as he's teaching on, um, what do we call it, the, the Sermon on the, on the Mountain or Sermon on the Mount. He's going through all these lessons and like Matthew 5.21, it says, hey, you have heard that uh, our ancestors said that, that you must not murder and, and if you do commit murder, you're subject to judgment. But then Jesus said, okay, that's your understanding of what you think the truth is, but let me just download real truth for you that if you are even angry at somebody, and, and we would ask would, without cause, then you are also in danger of judgment. Like Jesus spoke truth in areas that people didn't even understand. Or think about Matthew 5, 27, same Sermon on the Mount. Hey, you have heard that it was said, do not commit adultery. Don't, you know, don't sleep with your friend's spouse or your neighbor's spouse. Like, don't commit adultery. But then Jesus said, hey, that's only, you're missing the spirit of the law. You're missing the truth behind it. And Jesus said, hey, listen, if you even look at somebody with a lustful intent, you've already committed adultery in your heart. And so Jesus had this incredible way of speaking truth in every situation. And, and, he, and he spoke it with grace. I mean, think about the truth that he spoke to the woman that was caught in adultery. Jesus was like, hey, you know what? Like, I don't condemn you, but go and sin no more. Truth and grace. He didn't forsake the truth of it. But he also spoke with incredible grace. So the Samaritan woman who had five husbands, like Jesus doesn't really even engage it except to say, hey, come to me and I will give you living water. And so Jesus had this ability to speak truth in just incredible ways. What about Jesus as leader? Follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Jesus had the ability to instruct and guide to encourage and like 
average, everyday people that didn't have degrees, that didn't have accolades to their name, that Jesus could lead an ordinary fisherman like Paul, rather like Peter, who was just kind of outspoken, crazy, and caused through leadership him to be a great evangelist for the church. What an incredible leader that Jesus is. How great would it be to have walked with him in that capacity? And what about spiritual power? Blind people seeing and lame people walking and dead people rising and water turning into wine and fish and bread and multiplying. How many would have loved to have walked with Jesus? Right? And this is why Jesus' statement is so mind-blowing to you and to me when as he departs, as he's leaving this world, and the disciples are simply saying, oh, what's going to happen? What's going to go on? Like, what's, like you know, where, how are we going to go forward? Jesus says this, this crazy statement in John chapter 16, verse 7. Here's what he says. I tell you the truth, it is for your good. It is for your good that I'm going away. Unless I go away... The counselor or the Holy Spirit will not come to you, but if I go away, I will send him to you. In other words, Jesus was saying, listen, it is, as we will see in a moment, the living translation, it is actually better for you. It's better for you that I go away so that I can send the Holy Spirit to you. It's better for you. Just let that sit in your mind for a moment that Jesus, who did everything we said, says it's better for you and for me, that the Holy Spirit is sent to us. New Living Translation says, but in fact, it is best for you that I go away because if I don't, the advocate won't come. How could it be better? Let's go back to kind of where we left up a couple of weeks ago. So Jesus is saying, hey, don't let your hearts be troubled. Don't, don't let them be afraid. Don't be anxious and worried. And, and there's a lot you could worry about, but, but don't. And he, he starts saying why we shouldn't worry, why we shouldn't be anxious. anxious. We talk about uh, one of the reasons is that Jesus is preparing a place for us. So Jesus is saying, hey, you don't, you don't need to let your heart be worried and troubled and anxious because you may not understand what's happening right now, but know this, that I have a home prepared for you. And, 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 and if I got a home prepared for you, that means that, that I win, right? That, that I've got everything in control and you may not understand what's happening in this life, but I have a place just for you in mind. And then he goes on to say, and I'm coming back to get you. So like I'm coming back to get you. We win. It, like you may not understand everything, but because you know I have a place for you and because you know I'm coming back for you, you don't have to live in fear or anxiety. And then a third thing is added to this deal that we're going to talk about today. In John 14, 16, he says, and, and don't be anxious, don't be fearful, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever. Same thing in John 14, 26. But the counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name. So Jesus is saying, listen, it's going to be okay because I am sending a counselor. I'm sending the Holy Spirit to you. And as a matter of fact, it's better for you that the Holy Spirit comes. Why? Like, how could he say that? That's what we want to talk about this week and then probably not next week, but then the following week is like, why? How do we walk through that? How do we apply that um, in our lives? The Greek word for advocate or counselor is the word paraclete or parakletos, um, and it means to support, one called in for assistance. So Jesus is saying, I'm sending the Holy Spirit to come to you and and really, the Amplified Version says it a great way. Pull the amp this is what the Amplified Version says. But the Comforter, the Counselor, the Helper, the Intercessor, the Advocate, the Strengthener, the Standby, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, in my place, to represent me and act in my behalf, he will teach you all things. It's better for you. It's better for you. 
So if you have notes, would you write? I'm just going to give you a few today of why it's better for us. Just a few today, then we're going to go over a couple more in a, in a couple weeks. The first one, if you have your notes, is this. Why is it better for us that Jesus left? And here's what it is. Because the Holy Spirit is in you. Is in you. As a perfect counselor, if you are, if you accepted Jesus Christ as the Lord of your life, the moment that happened, there's a new supernatural birth that took place. You were born again. The Spirit of God takes residence in you. Like you walk around, not just as Joe or Jason or Fred or Tom, like you walk around with the presence of the Holy Spirit in you. 1 Corinthians 3.16 says that, hey, you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Like, don't you know yourselves that, like, the Spirit of God dwells within you? And so, in one sense, you know, Paul is saying to the Corinthians, hey, you know that the Holy Spirit lives in you, so don't be involved in fornication and keep your mind pure, keep your heart pure. Like, yeah, it's definitely one way that Paul says realize the Holy Spirit's in you, so there's some things you should not do. There's another sense of the word, too, that the Holy Spirit is in you, so there's some things you should do. The Holy Spirit's in you, so you should look for divine moments wherever you go. Jesus walked with the disciples. The Holy Spirit was around them, but the Holy Spirit is in you. And so you can be at Walmart, and God can be doing a miracle at Walmart, and you can be at your workplace at the mill, and God can be doing a miracle at the mill, and you can be at your home, and God's doing a miracle. Like, in other words, the Holy Spirit with you, in you, can be doing works in, like, in all of our lives at the same time. It's, it's better. The Holy Spirit's in you. you. You carry the presence of God with you wherever you go. You carry the presence of God when you go into your workplace that you, you, like, you literally bring God. Just think about this. I, I, like you bring God into the meeting room that you are part of. Like you bring God into that place. Like you, you bring God into the middle of a dangerous situation like you, you carry the presence of God in you. Just think about it for a moment. When you go to the grocery store that you carry the presence of God as a believer wherever you go. I, I'm so concerned that that we simply are unaware, that we're unaware of the Holy Spirit's presence in our lives. I'm concerned that we so often do things through the natural world and through human wisdom that we forget that the Holy Spirit is living within us and is guiding us and leading us and instructing us. Everything Jesus did, like the Holy Spirit is in us, available to do the same. And if I can just for a moment give you a correction in that same light, one of the reasons why I believe we have a difficult time recognizing the presence of the Holy Spirit is because we tend to think of the Holy Spirit as an it, as a force, as an entity, instead of the third person in the Trinity. The Holy Spirit is not an it, but he's a spirit. He's not an it, just a force, but like he has feelings. He can be grieved. He can be moved. He teaches. He leads. He guides. Sometimes I think we don't recognize the Holy Spirit because in our mindset, we're just like, we just need more of it, not recognize it. We just need more of him in our life. We need more, more awareness like he's fully in us. The Holy Spirit is fully all of God within us. And we just need to be aware and recognize the presence of God that we carry. So it grieves my heart when we talk about the Holy Spirit as if he's just some power out there, some, you know, 
Star Wars force. And we're missing out on the relationship that the Holy Spirit wants to have with you and me. A relationship and intimacy and awareness. He was there in creation. He's there to convict, to empower, to show us his will. He's there to have a relationship with us. Why is it better that Jesus leaves? Number two, because as a counselor, as an advocate, the Holy Spirit is our comforter. We live in a a world of distress. We live in a world of brokenness, of hurt. And we're not immune to it. Either were the disciples. If Jesus was crucified, how much more should we expect to be hurt and ridiculed? But in all of that, the Holy Spirit is our comforter. He stands with us, with you and in you. Just go back to Jesus, the same Jesus that was there when the sea, the sea was storming and the waves were in the Sea of Galilee and the disciples were fearful for their lives. Like the same Jesus that spoke and said, hey, be calm is the same Holy Spirit within us that speaks to the storms that we face and just says, hey, just be calm. As Jesus sent out the disciples to preach the gospel and heal the sick, he said, don't be afraid. He brought them comfort. You don't have to be afraid what people think, what they say, what they do. You don't have to be afraid that maybe you will fail. Jesus gave comfort in the same way the Holy Spirit in each one of our lives comforts us with the idea that you don't have to be afraid to step out in faith and trust God and do some miraculous things and take some risks. You don't have to be afraid that if you pray for someone to get healed, they don't get healed. Like You don't have to be afraid. The Holy Spirit, our comforter, speaks to us in the midst of fear. And he just speaks comfort. As a counselor, as an advocate, he is faithful. Faithful. The phrase, I love you, is such a popular phrase right now. It's used a lot. But when you say the words, I love you, it really means, think of 1 Corinthians 13, that I, I, as an action, I'm impatient towards you. As an action, I am forgiving towards you. As an action... I am kind towards you. As an action, I am long-suffering towards you. As an action, I, like, I'm not giving up on you. That's what love really means. And so when the Holy Spirit says that he loves us, that there's a faithfulness that stays that means, hey, I, I, I'm faithful that I'm patient with you, that I stand with you, that, that I'm not giving up on you, that, listen, by human nature, we're, we're going to fall. We're, we're going to make some mistakes. Like, that's why we need Jesus. Like, if we didn't need Jesus, right, if you were perfect, you wouldn't need him. And so, like, by human nature, we're going to fall. But the Holy Spirit is there in the midst of that saying, hey, I'm faithfully with you. I'm not leaving you in the midst of where you are. I'm going to help pull you out of the miry clay. I'm going to pick you up. I'm going to stay in you and speak truth. And I'm going to convict, but I'm going to do it in love and in grace. I'm going to equip you and empower you you to live the life that Jesus wants for you. Like the Holy Spirit is faithful even in the most difficult seasons of our life. I used to be so afraid, so afraid that I would fail, that I would commit this unpardonable sin that, man, that if I just, you know, I couldn't do things right and so afraid that I was losing the presence of God in my life. And like sometimes we just need to be aware that the Holy Spirit is not giving up on you. He's faithful. He's leading you to repentance and leading you to himself and glorifying Jesus. As a counselor and advocate, 
He speaks to us and leads us. Acts chapter 8, 29, it says the Spirit, the Holy Spirit said to Philip, hey, go over there to that chariot. Imagine a relationship with the Holy Spirit in such that you recognize his voice. That should be every day for us. So the Holy Spirit says, hey, go, go over there. And he sees somebody reading something, and he says, do you understand what you're reading? I don't understand it. How can I understand unless someone teaches me? And Philip has a chance to not only lead someone to Christ, but to baptize them in water. And, and just because he allowed the Holy Spirit to speak to him. In Acts 13, 2, it says that while the church, the people of God, were gathered together worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, he spoke, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. We need to hear the Holy Spirit's leading in our life. Holy Spirit, speak, lead, guide. Finally, as a counselor and advocate, and we'll touch on this one again in a couple of weeks, the Holy Spirit empowers us. Can I just help you quick? Um, whatever God's laying on your heart to do, when you keep telling yourself that you can't do it, can I just suggest to you that you're right? As soon as you think you're capable of doing what you believe God is calling you to do, you, you remove the opportunity for the Holy Spirit to intervene on your behalf. If, if you're only doing things, if we're only doing things that we know we can do, we have the capacity to do, then we're living in a natural world. And I just want to suggest to you that the Holy Spirit is there to empower us into a supernatural world to do things that we can't do by ourselves. Zechariah 4, 6 was rebuilding the temple and it looked like things weren't coming together. Gosh, it's awful reminiscent to me of building a playground that I have not been able to finish in the community center if you know anything. Almost everything's done but that playground anyway. Pray for me, please. They're working through rebuilding the temple after being in exile from Babylon and Zerubbabel was reminded by the Spirit of God in, in Zechariah 4, 6, that it's not by might, not by power, but by my Spirit, says the Lord. Church, we, we have to be aware, aware of the presence of God, of the Holy Spirit in our lives. How can Jesus say, it is better for me to go? He can say it because he's aware that the same Holy Spirit that he depended on to fulfill the mission that God called him to is the same Holy Spirit that he gave to you and to me that we can be dependent on to fulfill the mission that God has called us to. The same Holy Spirit. I know Greg mentioned that if he was Satan, one of the first things that he would destroy is the family unit, and that's true. I want to suggest another tactic of, uh, I believe, Satan's tactics. We live in a spiritual warfare. We live in a spiritual world. And uh, well, I think one of the tools that he uses is to get us unaware or fearful of the Spirit of God. If he can get us not thinking at all about the Holy Spirit living within us, we, in essence, become ineffective. And we just become a voice, just a natural word, and ineffective. And so I have started this morning, I would encourage you to do the same. I have started this morning with a prayer that simply said, Holy Spirit, thank you for being with me today. Help me to recognize you as my leader throughout the day. And I would encourage you maybe to pray that for the next couple of weeks. Write it down if you take a note. Holy, this every morning, wake up, Holy Spirit, thank you that you're here with me today. 
And would you help me recognize your leadership the rest of the day? I think that's a good way of starting, a good way of recognizing the Holy Spirit is with us. Amen?